Hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's Dentistry Unmasked. I'm Pam Maragliano Muniz, Chief Editor for Dental Economics Magazine. And with me, as always, every week. Turns out I'm David Rice, Chief Editor at Dentistry IQ. Pam, I'm excited today. You? Oh, my gosh. So this is actually a first for us, which I think is really exciting. So in our March issue for DE, the theme for the issue is DSOs and how confusing it is for practice owners, for associates, for pretty much everybody, maybe except for the DSO, um, when it comes to these different partnerships. And so what we've done is we've taken one of our really well-performing articles and decide to like turn it into a live conversation so we can kind of deepen the discussion. So with us today is Brandon Moncrief from McLaren and Associates. Brandon, welcome. Hey, Pam. Hey, David. Good to see you. Good to see Great you too. to see you. So you wrote an article about the top five mistakes that dentists make when they're partnering with a DSO. And so I would imagine there's a lot of mistakes. <laughs> that are made. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The but, list, the list definitely gets longer and longer. I could probably do top 25 mistakes, but that would take up a whole issue. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine. So let's kind of get right into it. What is, what are some of the more common mistakes or maybe something that we're not even thinking about when we're even considering this type of partnership? I, I think one of the, the first missteps that dentists often make is really not taking a pragmatic approach to the DSO decision, right? Um, defining your why, defining your goals, making sense of whether it makes sense to go down the DSO road in the first place, and then if so, when, and then how to approach it, ensuring that you clearly define the narrative regarding what you're looking to accomplish, and you have the right team of professionals advising you, so that when you go to market, you can communicate that narrative to potential buyers because fit is as important or more important than valuation. So mm -hmm. making sure that whoever you partner with is well positioned to help you accomplish your goals is key to being happy long term, because in most of these transactions, you're going to stick around for three to five years. You're not going to exit at the point of sale like a traditional practice transition. So making sure that you affiliate with the right DSO that's prepared to accomplish your goals and support you long term. And then also that has a sustainable business model that has a high probability of getting to a recapitalization event at a handsome return is also key. Um, not all D DSOs are created equal. And we say this a lot. If you met one DSO, you've met one DSO. <laughs> so that leads to kind of the, the next mistake that a lot of dentists make, and that is failure to create competition, you know, mm. not creating optionality, not talking to multiple buyers. They get a direct mailer or their buddy, you know, tells them that they should call the same DSO that they sold to. And they enter into what they think is a casual conversation that quickly turns into a sale. Um, and if you don't shop around, if you don't date around, if you don't create optionality, you risk selling to the wrong DSO, partnering you know, with the wrong company and or leaving economics on the table because you don't have any leverage to hold their feet to the fire and negotiate a more favorable economic outcome from both the valuation perspective and a deal structure perspective. So we just hit on two, you know, failure to, to not define your why and your goals and then failure to create competition for your practice and optionality by talking to multiple buyers. Okay. I've got so much here. So I'm thinking, <laughs> so, all right, everybody has their why maybe, and maybe they have goals. I think that I'm going to be like very simple about this. And I feel like a lot of dentists are like, well, I want to retire at this age, or maybe, you know, something hurts or something, and it's time for me to think about retirement. And so I think a lot of times we think, okay, so my why is because I kind of have to, or it's time. And my goal is to get the most amount of money. Now, is that realistic or what kind of whys do people have that makes partnering with a DSO a better alignment than say selling to uh, you know, their associate? That's a great question. And, and the, the whys have started to change 
uh, pretty dramatically over the past five years. Our average client previous to five years ago was the client that you described. You know, they're within three to five years, maybe even less of retirement. They're looking to maximize the value of, you know, one of their most valuable assets, their practice, and they're looking to lock in their exit strategy. But more recently, we're working with younger and younger doctors that still have 10, 15, 20 years left in their career. And a lot of their whys are to de-risk, take some chips off the table. For most large practice owners, their dental practice is their most valuable asset. They have a tremendous amount of their personal net worth tied up in their business. And many of them have built large multi-doc, multi-million dollar businesses, more money, more problems, right? More, more staff, more headaches. And especially if they're still working chair side, you know, it's hard to work in the business full time and then have enough time to work on the business and have a personal life and, you know, spend time with your spouse and spend time with your kids. So for a lot of young practice owners that are maybe 10, 15 years in ownership, they're looking for better work-life balance. They're looking for operational administrative support. They're looking to de-risk, take some chips off the table and affiliate with a DSO you know, for that reason. So for most of our clients, it's a combination of economics, right? The, the money matters to, to everybody. Uh, but for many of them, the motivating factor is also to get some help, uh, to fight some of the headwinds that dentistry is facing, you know, downward pressure on reimbursement rates from PPOs. The DSOs can leverage their economies of scale and their size to negotiate better reimbursement rates. And then upward pressure on overhead. You know, overhead has gone up substantially post-COVID and DSOs have more resources to bring to bear to help solve some of the HR nightmares that people are dealing with. They can buy benefits for much less than private practice owners can, and they can leverage vendors for better pricing when it comes to dental supplies, equipment, labs. So combination of economics and then operational help those are the two driving forces behind a lot of our sellers. Why? And then obviously we also have some clients that, you know, look more like our traditional client where it's a, it's a retirement strategy. It's an exit strategy. So I have a question as it pertains to fit and risk specifically for this younger group that's considering this. So let's say I negotiate a deal. And I feel like, wow, the fit is great, but the climate is such where some, maybe more than some, but some DSOs out there are saying like, Hey, we need to trim some of the practices that we've previously said yes with, you know, maybe, maybe we don't need to be involved in all of these States, or maybe we were involved with all of these specialties. And now we want to take one or two of those off the table. So they're going out and removing those practices and selling them to another group, like how risky is that? If I'm, you know, a guy who's out 10 to 15 years, I feel like I've got the right fit. And now maybe the game changes because I'm going to be with another group. Is that a, is that a thing? Is that a low risk, high risk, moderate risk? It doesn't happen frequently, at least yet. So the evolution of this version of DSOs, you know, what some people refer to as like IDSOs, um, is relatively new and has not been tested long term. I mean, this concept has really caught fire over the past five to seven years. At some point, you are going to see the consolidators start to consolidate, right? right? Once the market reaches a certain saturation point where new private equity firms are not entering dentistry because there's only so much meat left on the bone from a consolidation standpoint. Once we get to the point where let's say 60 to 65% of practices that private equity would want to acquire are DSO owned. You're going to see some consolidation among the consolidators. So at that point, we're probably, I think, seven to 10 years away from that point where you're going to see mass consolidation. And maybe there's only seven to 10 DSOs left and they're all, you know, the size of Heartland at some point. Yeah, yeah. there is a potential risk down the road that, your business could be owned by a different DSO than the one that you're partnering with today. But so far, so good in the sense that there's very few DSOs that have had to divest assets and sell them to another DSO for one reason or the other. So I would say that as of today, 
that risk is relatively low. But you do need to consider the fact that if you sell to a smaller DSO, there is potential for higher upside on the equity component, but there is also the potential that they could be acquired by a larger DSO. So if you sell to a DSO that say has less than 50 locations, there is a chance that they could sell to one of the much larger DSOs out there that have deep pockets and can afford to knock down an acquisition of that size. High probability if you sell to a DSO that has more than 200 locations that they're not going to be acquired by another DSO. It, financially, economically speaking, it just doesn't make sense. There's only been a handful of transactions of that size where one DSO was buying another. But I think the, the bigger point you make is the younger you are, the more runway you have before you're planning to exit your business, the more critical fit is, right? Because if you're going to be with that DSO for 10, 15, 20 years, that's a long time. So really evaluating, is that the right partner for your business long term is critical as opposed to, you know, a doc that's 62, that's got three years to retirement, you know, three years is different than 20 years. Yeah. So the younger you are, the more sensitive you should be to fit and the more your why is related to support and infrastructure and operational help, I think the more important the fit conversation has to be. Makes sense. Okay, so you have your why. You kind of know what kind of deal you're hopefully going to get. You want to know what your life is going to be like after the transition. It sounds to me like it's quite a fishing exposit expedition <laughs> to find the right DSO. There's a lot of them out there. And you're right. I think a lot of us kind of go by word of mouth or by emails that might come in, or maybe at a conference, there's a table. How do you fish through all of these DSOs to ensure that your goals are being met by this transaction? I think you need to have a good team of advisors for one. You need to have a sell side advisor, somebody like us to represent you that is constantly vetting all the buyers in the marketplace to keep track of who's who, who has money, who doesn't, who's positioned for long-term you know, success, who actually has infrastructure and can help from an operational perspective and who doesn't. Um, so you need to build a team of advisors, a sell-side advisor, you need to have your CPA, your financial advisor involved in the conversation. And I think the key there is you need to go on a fishing expedition, right? You actually need to shop your practice in a formal process rather than just, you know, taking the recommendation of your friend that sold to this particular DSO and by default selling to that one buyer without dating around or getting one of those direct mailers or having a business development guy or girl from a DSO knock on your door and not creating a competitive environment because every doctor has a different why. You know, some of them may look the same, but there's nuances involved. Everybody has a different personal situation. Everybody's practice is different. Everybody is at a different stage in their career and a different season in life. And their personal financial situation is different. So thinking that the same DSO is going to be the right fit for you, your buddy, and three of your other colleagues, I think is a, is a mistake. If we take five practices to market tomorrow, there's a high probability we sell all five of them to different buyers. So you've got to create optionality in order to have perspective on what's out there. And you've got to create optionality, multiple offers, multiple conversations with numerous DSOs to create leverage, to hold their feet to the fire, to maximize the economics. So that leads to kind of the next mistake, and that is failure to control the narrative regarding EBITDA and control the narrative regarding structure and maximize the economics. Because the number one way that DSOs and private equity is opportunistic is to try to get what they call a proprietary deal, a doctor that calls them from a referral from a colleague or a direct mailer or whatever it may be. They're not talking to any other DSOs and then that allows the buyer to control the conversation regarding EBITDA, regarding value, regarding deal structure. 
And if the buyer is controlling that conversation, you run the risk that you sell to the wrong DSO and that you leave potentially, if you have a large practice, millions of dollars on the table. That doesn't check any of my boxes, Pam. This <laughs> <laughs> No, most definitely not. And okay, so back in the day, and I'm, I don't even think it's even back in the day still, I know when I bought my practice and I've spoken to other owners about, you know, maybe considering a second purchase, that kind of thing. It has got to be on the DL, lock and key, sign an NDA, all the things. And you mentioned shopping around your practice. Are we still able to do this on the DL or is doing that kind of gone by the wayside? No, DSOs are very sensitive to confidentiality. And obviously our confidentiality is the cornerstone of, of my business. So everything we do is kind of behind the veil. We're going to want your associates and your staff to know, but at the appropriate time. And we need to make sure that we control the narrative at the time that they're informed that a partnership and affiliation, you don't use the word sale you know, has occurred. So we make sure that all the buyers that we deal with have signed NDAs. So they know that they have to keep everything extremely confidential. When we market practices, yes, they go on our website, but they go with a very generic description. And then we likely already know the top 10 or 15 buyers in the DSO world for any particular practice that we're going to take to market. So we don't take a shotgun approach. We take a very hands-on boutique approach to how we approach the marketplace. And we're going to send out the marketing deck for your business to a select group of the DSOs that we work with. There's over 500 DSOs across the country. We work regularly with about 75. But depending on the type of practice you have, the size, the number of doctors, the revenue level, the EBITDA, the patient mix, the procedural mix, and your geography, that's going to determine what, what are the top 15 to 20 DSOs based on your why and the unique characteristics of your practice that it makes sense for us to market the business to. And we're going to send emails and pick up the phone and have conversations with those particular DSOs when we take a new opportunity to market all the meetings and Zoom calls as we introduce our clients to buyers all happen after hours. Um, everything we do is behind the veil so that we don't alarm your staff, your associate doctors, and certainly not your patients that were entertaining a DSO affiliation. Because up until the point that we sign legal agreements, all we're doing is having a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Until it's binding... Until you have made a firm decision that you're going to go down this path, you found the right partner, and closing is imminent, it doesn't make sense to rock the boat. Telling your team prematurely or your patients finding out is uh, detrimental in the sense that even if you think you're doing the right thing, you're going to cause them a lot of undue stress, and they may go look for another job. The reality is that, and this is kind of a misnomer, a lot of people think if I sell my practice to a DSO or private equity, there's going to be a tremendous amount of change that's going to occur. We also sell practices to private buyers. So I've been involved in the sale of over 2,000 practices to individual buyers outside of the DSO world. Far more change typically occurs when you sell your practice to a private buyer as opposed to a DSO buyer. The DSOs of today are in the business of buying quality practices that are generating significant EBITDA, partnering with great clinicians, and then supporting the business behind the veil, not trying to reinvent the wheel. If they make major changes, that's going to upset the dentist. It's going to upset the team. And as a result, they're basically lighting their investment on fire and burning it to the ground. <laughs> so you would cause your team a lot of undue stress if you notify them too early because the reality is that their jobs are secure. You're not going anywhere. And for the most part, it's going to be business as usual post-affiliation. So uh, friends, listeners, I heard two major things in there. Number one, um, if you're not, if you're, if someone's approaching you through an email or a cold call and that's a buyer of one and you're not looking at 
15 to 20 potential buyers, that's troublesome. And two, if you're looking to make this move, you really have to have your house in order in order to maximize where you're going. So how many how many potential sellers do you sit with and say, okay, David Rice, so you want to make this sale today and I get it, but you're really not ready. You need to do X, Y, Z in order to get yourself ready. So probably half of, yeah. of the dentists that walk in our door, we always start with a discovery call, a casual conversation to get to know each other. And then if we feel that it makes sense to move on to doing a deep dive, doing an EBIT analysis, doing evaluation, really quantifying you know, what's possible if we were going to go down the DSO path and also evaluating, does a DSO affiliation or private equity partnership even make sense, you know, for your situation? Uh, we'll go down that path. And through that discovery process, oftentimes we find out that either your why or your practice doesn't align with what DSOs are prepared to offer. So it doesn't make sense to go down that path or it's not the right time. Whether that's, you need to clean up your financials and increase your EBITDA so that your practice is going to be more marketable and more valuable. Or let's say your practice is on a steep growth trajectory and it makes sense to allow the business to mature further, grow your EBITDA, maybe onboard an additional provider, whatever it may be, before we go to market so that we time it appropriately and we don't leave any value on the table. You know, we're blessed to be very busy. There's a lot of sell side activity going on in the marketplace today. Our firm is well positioned and well known in the marketplace. So we don't need to convince somebody to go to market tomorrow to make a commission if it's not in their best interest. So we're always taking a very objective approach to what are you looking to accomplish? Does this option make sense? And if so, when? Perfect. All right. So I know we don't have that much time left. I have more questions, but let's get to number four. Cool. So one of the other big mistakes that dentists make is just not asking the right questions, not fully understanding the deal structure, because each DSO is nuanced in regards to the levers involved in their deal. It's just, it's not about just cash at closing. There's going to be an equity component involved in every single one of these transactions. So understanding how that equity component functions along the way on an annual basis and what are your rights at recap you know is the equity at the practice level or the parent company level are you going to receive ongoing pro rata ebitda distributions at recap can you sell all of your equity or just a part of your equity do you get the parent company multiple or is there a ceiling on that multiple if it's a joint venture structure is there a management fee if so what is it how is that going to erode ongoing EBITDA? How is that going to come into play when there's a recap event? Are they levering the practice with debt? There are so many levers involved in these deals. That's just the questions that you have to ask from a deal structure perspective, but also getting to know the identity of the DSO. Who's your financial sponsor? What's their track record in the dental world? What's their track record in other healthcare verticals? Uh, when was the last recap? When's the next recap expected to occur? What's the projected return? What type of infrastructure do you have? How do you support your partner practices on a daily basis from an HR, you know, marketing perspective, whatever pain points you may have that you want support with? So there are about, if you do it right, there's probably 50, 60 questions that you need to ask every single buyer that you talk to. We believe diligence is a two-way street. DSOs are going to ask for probably everything short of a blood sample when they evaluate <laughs> if they want to buy your practice. You need to be asking a lot of questions too, especially right now. Diligence on buyers is more critically important than it's ever been in this space because there are some DSOs that are over-levered, that are over their skis operationally, that maybe they're not close to insolvency or bankruptcy, but you know they're in trouble at the moment. And you need to know how to vet those DSOs so that you don't pull the trigger, sell your practice, and then find out later that this DSO is you know, not well positioned to get to that second bite of the apple and to help you accomplish your goals 
you know, on a day-to-day basis. Oh man, that is so important. I hear lots of horror stories from people who haven't done their homework and it's just too late for them. Well, wait a minute. I wouldn't say they haven't done their homework because I feel like they don't know what you don't know. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, you can try to do your homework, but if you don't even know what you should be seeking, like, how do you even ask the question? You know what I mean? Like you just, you don't know. So I feel like if anything else, if you get anything out of today, and if you're, you know, one of the dentists that are thinking about this type of partnership, get a team behind you because you really (laughs) don't know what you don't know. And so you might think you're asking all the questions, but when you're saying there's 50 or 60 questions, I don't even know if I could come up with 50 or 60. I'd be like, do you have a cat? Like, I mean, I don't know how many questions I could possibly come up with that would be relevant to this deal. And I also think what's confusing for a lot of people is how do you get out? You know, like you're still having equity, but like when you want to leave, can you just leave when you want to? Or are you locked in for a period? You know, I know there's a period of time that you kind of have to stay, but say you stay beyond that time. And I know Marco Vujicic wrote an article about the fact that a lot of dentists actually like this this partnership and they're staying longer than their contracted time. But when you want to actually go, how do you go? Right. How do you divest yourself of, of the equity? That's just one, you know, question out of those 60 questions that you need to be asking. And you're probably going to get a different answer from each DSO, right? So keeping track of all of that information. And then once you have, you know, 10 offers and you've asked all those questions and you've compiled all that data, then how do you compare apples to apples, right? How do you actually get to a point where you can make a competent decision? So that's a big part of what we do for our clients is not just create competition and optionality, but then once we have the offers, go through them and then try to determine, you know, who is the best fit or or who are the top two or three that are the best fit? And then what's our strategy for negotiating to arrive at a final letter of intent? And then even once you sign a letter of intent, the process is pretty intensive on the closing side and making sure that you control the narrative regarding EBITDA during quality of earnings and You've got the legal agreements to deal with and a lot of negotiation and nuances there. You know, having somebody to shepherd you through that process that's been through it hundreds of times and knows what to look out for and how to create leverage and how to hold the DSO's feet to the fire and hold them accountable, not just pre-LOI, but throughout the whole process so that you don't end up in a situation where, and we see this on off-market deals where we're not involved, Two weeks before close, you've just spent six months going through diligence. You've given everything, maybe even a blood sample, and they want to retrade the deal for some arbitrary reason that is not well-defined. And you can't create leverage because you didn't have seven other offers, seven other buyers that are standing there saying, hey, if that DSO screws around, we still want to buy the practice. And you don't have somebody like us there with a CPA and an analytics team behind you defending the EBITDA through quality of earnings. You might get to the end, they retrade the deal, and you're either forced to start over with somebody else yeah, or bite your tongue and do a deal at you know, terms that were not what you agreed to in the letter of intent. So there's so much involved in this process if you do it right. But it's been alarming to watch hundreds, if not thousands of dentists sell their businesses to DSOs without creating optionality, without having the right advisors at the table. And Pam, David, that's the reason we got involved in the space. So we pushed against the DSO consolidation of the industry for a while. You know, we built our business, which has been around 35 years doing traditional practice sales. But when we saw in our backyard in Texas, where we're headquartered, DSOs come in and start buying practices from doctors that were not educated about EBITDA, EBITDA multiples, all of these levers involved in these deal structures and really taking advantage of them, that's when we knew we had to get involved and we had to build out this side of our business to represent large practice owners that were looking to go down this path. That makes sense. So it's crazy how fast 30 minutes goes. Can we have like a cliffhanger on number five and direct everybody to that DE article, Pam? Yes. So if you want to hear number five, you know what to do. Go to, you know what to do. 
dentaleconomics.com. You can either get the magazine digitally. It's available in print. Check it out. And yeah, no, unfortunately, we didn't even have time to get to number five. But I think I think you gave us a really good idea and a deeper dive to what the article gave. So, Brandon, thank you so much. I'm sure there's people who, besides wanting number five, so go to the magazine for that. <laughs> but they might have questions beyond that. So yeah. can you drop your email or anything like that for us? Yeah, absolutely. People always say I'm crazy when I do this, but I'll give you my cell phone number. You can call awesome. me. You can text me. This is what I do all day long. I've got a great team behind me. So my job is really just to have those discovery calls, get to know large practice owners and you know talk about their goals and what they're looking to accomplish and see if it makes sense to take the next step. My cell is 512-660-8505. My email is Brennan, B-R-A-N-N-O-N at dentaltransitions.com. And I encourage you to go to our website. We've got a DSO uh, resources landing page that's got a lot of conversations just like this, podcasts, webinars, articles. That's dentaltransitions.com. Awesome. Friends, I got to tell you, I learned a ton. And if you're going to negotiate and navigate these waters and get the best deal and a cookie, by the way, if I'm giving blood, I want the cookie. Um, it's going to pay you to not try to do your homework on your own and get with the right people who can help you. That 60 question thing is just stuck in my brain. And to your point, Pam, I don't know if I could come up with 60 questions on my own, but this was great. Thank you so much for being here. Pam, you want to take us home? Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon, for your time today. And everybody, thank you for tuning in with us. And we cannot wait to see you next week. So don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave us a review. We want to hear from you as long as it's nice. And we will see you all next week. See ya. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening to the show this week. And thanks to our guests and sponsors on this episode. Please check out our social media at Dr. Pamela underscore Maragliano and at Dental Economics Official. Or you can check me out at Ignite DDS or at Dr. David Rice. And go to dentaleconomics.com to receive dental economics. You can choose to receive DE in print or digitally, and you can also get the details of our Principles of Practice Management Conference on our website. If you have top Topics or guests or anything you'd like to talk about on the show, send us an email to dentistryunmaskedpodcast at gmail.com and we will do our very best to make it happen. Thanks again and we'll see you next week.